Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And I'm Jason Kitty Cat Inman. Welcome to your Mind <laughs> University, the podcast Geek History Lesson that you are now listening to has taken over all of your audio and auditory responses. <laughs> and we are going to fill it with all the lessons about a character construct of pop culture. That's what we do every week. That's why we call it the Mind University. Yes. And this week is a Superman supporting character Mm -hmm. who now has a much larger role in the comic books and on TV screens everywhere and will be appearing soon in Supergirl Rebirth. Ashley, who are we talking about? We're talking about Miss Cat Grant. That is right. Miss Cat Grant, uh, played by Callista Flockhart on the Supergirl TV show. And we're going to be stepping you through everything of her entire history in less than an hour. And let's head right into the first section of our podcast, The Ten Cent Origin, where we give you the Clip Notes version of everything you need to know about this character in case you go to a Cat Grant-themed cocktail party and somebody was like, hmm, where'd that Cat Grant come from? She is, of course, a DC Comics character created by Marv Wolfman and Jerry Ordway, who first appeared in Adventures of Superman number 424, which was published in January of 1987. Oh, she's an 80s character. She is. She's a lot younger than I thought wow. she was. Wow. Okay, because I thought she was like from the 70s. Nope, you are incorrect. All she, right. uh, she is a journalist who has worked for both the Daily Planet and the Galaxy Broadcasting System, and like Jason said earlier, is currently being played by Callista Flockhart on the now CW's Supergirl television show. Show. Cool. And uh, that's that's about all the tents and origin I can give you on Cat Grant. <laughs> Yay. Let's move into the next section of our podcast, Meet Cute, which is a term that we stole from romantic comedies where we're going to tell you how we first encountered the character of Cat Grant. Ashley, mm-hmm. where did you first encounter the character of Cat Grant? I literally have no idea. And we're going to get into this in the lesson a little bit more, but Cat is a character, and we've done a couple of these in the past, uh, like Killer Frost, for example, who is very much... Um, a supporting character. She's very much on the precipice of what is going on. And so sometimes she's not as involved in the main storyline as some of your leading characters like your Supermans and your Lois Lanes. So I don't remember the first time I ever met Cat Grant because she made I, probably so little an impression on me. Um, but I feel like I've known about her as long as I've known about the Daily Planet. So... I don't have a good meet cute this week, unfortunately. Ah. How about you? Do you have a did Cat Grant make a strong impression on you when you first met? Yep. Because I first okay. met her in the Death of Superman where she was interviewing Superman. But I remember Cat Grant because she was always working for one of the other networks in the Superman universe. And I remember, and I'm certain you're going to talk about it, so I'm not going to spoil it, but she gets involved with this storyline when Superman has a mullet, and uh, there's a very famous cover where Superman's crying on the cover, Mm -hmm. and the villain is holding a knife over him. I remember I read this issue so much that the oils of my skin uh, faded away the (laughs) the, the colors on the cover, and they turn the Superman villain into a murderer. And this murderer really affects Cat Grant's life. Again, I'm not going to say what it is because I'm certain you're going to talk about it. I think I know to what you are referring. So, but a very famous Dan Jurgens cover. Yes. Yep. All right, let's move right into the History 101. Yes. Our main meat of the lesson, we're actually going to tell us everything we need to know about Cat Grant. So, Catherine Jane Cat Grant was originally created because DC Comics wanted to introduce a potential love interest for Clark Kent. And at the time of her creation, it had not been decided whether or not she was actually going to get a date with the Man of Steel himself. They basically thought that the relationship between Lois slash Clark slash Superman uh, needed some spicing up because it had gone on for so long and it could use, I guess, uh, a little facelift. And so, they brought that on in the form of Cat Grant. And the interesting thing about this is this is is right before um, this is post Crisis on Infinite Earth. It is. This is also around the same time where they um, they were pretty close to making Clark Kent and Lois uh, fiancés. It's true. It's true. She is introduced, like I said, in Adventures of Superman number four twenty four as the gossip columnist of the Daily Planet. So now let's go back and I'll tell you a little bit about her character history. Okay. Cool. She is a Los Angeles native and lived here for all of her professional life before immigrating. And while living in Los Angeles, she wrote a syndicated gossip column. So she already had a lot of clout by the time the Daily Planet scooped her up. She had a wonderful career out talking smack about celebrities in the hills. 
She had been married to a man named Joe Morgan, who was abusive, and his abusive behavior not only drove Kat out of Los Angeles, but they also also drove her to drink. And Kat's alcoholism is a character trait that really came to define her in the comics for a really long time, mm-hmm. although it is something that... Um, in in her most recent incarnation has kind of been forgotten and brushed under the rug. And I'm assuming, yes. Um, And I'm assuming because she does have the mentor role to Supergirl in the TV show and it seems like she's going to be having a similar role in the Rebirth title that that is something that will be forgotten uh, for the better, I think. It's the same thing as Tony Stark's alcoholism. Or or Captain Marvel's. Yeah. It's something that uh, you definitely have to uh, respect because it was something that was such Mm. an important part of their characters. But it's probably best forgotten. It definitely, especially, uh, especially with the popularities of the movies and the TV shows. Mm -hmm. Uh, We got to walk the children in nature where it's safe. So Kat leaves Joe and takes their young son, Adam, to Metropolis with her, where she wants to focus on remaining sober and working hard for her son. Now, if you are a Supergirl television show fan, uh, you should recognize Adam. Uh, You should recognize that name. He has a grown-up incarnation on the show. When she gets to the Daily Planet, Kat is immediately attracted to Clark Kent, because who wouldn't be? And they do get to date very briefly, but it doesn't last no matter how much Kat wants it to. And her attraction to Clark is something that never really goes away, and it kind of comes in fits and starts as the writer decides it needs to, according to whatever narrative she is, uh, she's involved with. But, makes, but think about that. I think that's a brilliant move because Lois is always attracted to Superman more so than Clark Kent. So to mm-hmm. introduce a female character who's attracted to Clark Kent. Also, if you look at her backstory, she loves the stability. She does. She loves that Clark is a good, down-to-earth... He's actually a good man. ...nice guy. Yeah. yeah. He's totally... Like, the thing about Clark Kent is he should be utterly unthreatening. Yeah. Uh, is, you know, in the opposite of Superman. And that makes a lot of sense. And uh, like I said, they do date. And after that, Clark and Kat do remain good friends throughout their various incarnations on the Daily Planet staff that they have both been a part of. And Clark is often focused on trying to fix Kat's problems um, or issues that are going on in her life rather than any romantic endeavors, often to Kat's frustration. And there is a little bit of tension between Kat and Lois for a really long time. Um, For obvious reasons, they are professional rivals in that they are the two um, highest ranked women on the Daily Mm -hmm. Planet, even though Lois is definitely her superior. And when you think about it, Lois is very focused on hard edged journalism and Kat is focused on uh, gossip and arts and entertainment and what what I would call frou-frou journalism. Lois doesn't treat her seriously. She doesn't. Um, they do eventually, in some arcs, come to an equilibrium. Um, but as the uh, the beautiful professional women, I think they find a, they take issue with each other. Mm-hmm. And even though Clark Kent soon lo- loses interest in poor Cat romantically, young Jimmy Olsen is more than willing to step up to the plate. You go even get him, Jimmy. Do- she doesn't notice. There's a lot of really funny panels. Um, like I said, in most of their incarnations where Jimmy's sort of pining after Kat because she's always very beautiful and she wears a lot of makeup. And yeah. It's, it's silly, but it's sweet. He, he, right. It's I think it's his most Archie Andrews character trait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Kat, of course, ignores Jimmy, uh, although she does, although this, I'm sorry, she often ignores Jimmy and this will lead him to moping around the office and getting in the way of him getting the job done, which sometimes uh, pisses off some of their coworkers. Perry White and Lois Lane in particular are often frustrated with Kat's behavior around the office and her, shall we say, less than conventional tactics for chasing a lead or getting an interview. And uh, that is something that we will talk a little bit more about later. All right. Uh, eventually, Kat feels pressure to live up uh, to Perry and Lois's judgment and decides that she needs to leave the gossip column behind her and become a, quote, real reporter, yeah. end quote. Um, and that is something that uh, the, the DC Comics writers have decided. I'm not saying that gossip reporting is not real reporting. She then breaks from the Daily Planet to join Galaxy Broadcasting. Oh, I know, remember this. Mm-hmm, which I had never heard about yep. until I did research for this character. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as a reporter there... Uh, Kat, along with the help of Clark Kent, is able to expose Morgan Edge's links to Intergang. Yep. Now, Jason, who is Morgan Edge? Uh, I believe... Okay, I, I, I can't remember. I think he is the CEO of Galaxy Broadcasting. He is the president. Yeah. I'm so excited that you know that, uh-huh. um, of Galaxy Broadcasting Systems and the owner of their television station, WGBS. 
uh, which is also the media corporation that eventually buys out the Daily Planet. Yeah, that's why in some versions of the the Clark Kent origins, the Superman origin story, mm-hmm. sometimes Morgan Edge is the publisher yes. of the Daily Planet and Perry White's the editor. Yes. And uh, really quick, what is Intergang? Intergang is this super futuristic a uh, crime organization in Metropolis led by Bruno Mannheim, who you eventually find out is getting weapons from Apocalypse Darkseid. Yes. So basically, the station that Kat decides to go and work for um, is by a proxy owned by Darkseid and is up to evil, no good things. Mm-hmm. And breaking this story does catapult Kat into a new level of celebrity and notoriety that she has never experienced before. So although she's had a lot of professional success, this becomes her big break. Unfortunately, it also made her the target of local gangs and crime lords for the first time in her life. So how do you deal with something like that? Well... In order to ensure her safety, Kat hires a bodyguard named Jose Delgado. Now, does that name sound familiar to you? Is he the gangbuster? He is. He is, of course, the vigilante gangbuster. You're nailing it. Yep. I thought I was going to get you with, yeah, some, yeah. Of these, uh, with some of these curveballs. Hey, you're, 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 you are knee-deep in 90s Superman, <laughs> and that is my jam. And you are Mr. DC. <laughs> um, and having gangbuster around eventually leads to a romantic relationship between yep, Kat and Jose, um, which I, I, read, I read some of these issues, and I think it's super weird and out of left field. Um, but when you think about it, he may not be Superman, but he's still a superhero. And Gangbuster, although definitely not an A-lister, is a pretty good guy, again, by comparison to her first husband. Gangbuster, by the way, uh, faithful listeners, <laughs> um, is a costumed identity. Here, we're going to go We're gonna go silly town. We're going to go real deep cut. Uh, he is, Gangbuster was a costumed identity that was once worn by Superman. Superman oh, was it really? Yes, yeah, Superman, when, in the late 80s, when, when John Byrne wrote the story where he he went into the other dimension and killed General Zod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when he came back, uh, Superman couldn't deal with the guilt. And so, like, he started having depression and split personalities and stuff like that. And one of the split personalities, while he was sleeping, Clark Kent would wake up and dress up as Gangbuster and go beat people up. And then I, and then I, I, I correct me, I, I might be wrong on this, uh, and and feel free to correct me, dear listeners. But I think he just like threw the gangbuster costume into an alleyway. I think, and I think that's where and Jose ho- and finds Jose, it. And Jose found it. Um, and, and not to disrespect the great John Byrne, that's a stupid idea. It was really silly. <laughs> it's very, it's very eighties. Yeah. It's very silly. Um, so they're dating right now, and Kat's mm-hmm. young son Adam does not like his mom dating Gangbuster because he still loves his father. How, and, how old is Adam at this point? Would you guess? Uh, he's about eight. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. His uh, his age is is listed a little later on in an event that we're coming up on pretty quickly. His age also changes on the whims of the writer. It does. Yeah. Um, but I I always think of him as younger than ten because okay. ten is uh is when that fateful day happens. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't like his mom dating Gangbuster because uh, he still loves his father and doesn't understand why his parents split in the first place uh, because, you know, uh, domestic violence is a difficult thing to explain to a child. Kat stays at WGBS as a full-time on-air reporter and soon gets her own talk show, The Cat Grant Show. <laughs> she even manages to secure an interview with Superman. <sighs> That is, unfortunately, interrupted when Doomsday goes on a rampage through the city. Yep. And uh, later on, it it's is... a great interview, by the way. That, that that actually issue, even though it's weird that most of the issue is a, is a report, and then it keeps uh, juxtaposing to the Justice League getting their asses handed to themselves yeah, by yeah, Doomsday. Yeah. Um, if you go back and read that, uh, Dan Jurgens is an excellent thing where she basically asks these questions like, why does the world need Superman? Why don't you stop war? And Superman's answers in that issue are great. Not only that, but I think that um, Dan Jurgens really does take this opportunity to prove that Kat Grant is a great journalist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she does deserve this 100%. position that she's got to. And I think that's something that gets a little lost in her character um, in the modern age. And we'll talk a little bit about her character's personality changes. But it's cool to see that while she may not be Lois Lane, because I mean, that's an impossible standard. Nobody and who, is Lois and who Lane. could be. How um, dare you? 
No, but she's definitely <laughs> she's definitely a hard nosed reporter. Yep. Um, and so later on in that same story, it is revealed that Cat followed Superman to the scene and reports live from the scene of his battle with Doomsday. Mm-hmm. So she, like any good field reporter, goes right into the heart of danger because you need to bring coverage to your audience. And I think that's a very admirable trait in mm-hmm. her as well. She's, and I think this is some of the stuff that you were talking about yep. in the intro. She's there when uh, when when Superman falls and dies. Yeah. And it's she's kind of your audience analog through that because there's yep. not a lot of civilians, obviously, who are around during that time. And I think this might be, in terms of her involvement in classic storylines and big events, one of the most important things that Kat Grant is a part of. Well, they use her as the the exposition tool. Mm-hmm. Like, because they can cut to the TV screen and be like, oh, Superman looks pretty beaten and he just was thrown into the x bottle wall building. Yeah. You know. Uh, it also, for me, epitomizes that Kat Grant can and will turn any situation into her advantage. 100%. So, so she's like, oh, we're doing this interview and you fly away to an emergency. We better go to this emergency as well and get our cover exclusive coverage on this because we knew about it first. First. Yep. Uh, like any good journalist. And during her tenure at WGBS. WGBS. Uh, because there's two like E consonant sounds, I got to say it real slow or it'll get bad. WGBS. <laughs> sounds like a I station it, that Frasier would work for. I wonder if the BS is intentional. I See, I thought it was when it turned out that Morgan Edge was a bad guy. Okay, okay. Uh, I, yeah, I had that thought as well. Have your parents explain that to you, kids. Yeah, so during her time there, <laughs> Cat Grant does continue to freelance with the Daily Planet because yep. a girl got a hustle and even manages to earn Lois Lane's beloved respect by cutting news coverage and interviews that she is putting out there. So Lois sees that Cat has really left the gossip colonists in her behind. She's doing really interesting editorials. And so she's able to apologize to Kat for having misjudged her and they strike up a really nice working relationship and I find their friendship really a refreshing step away from the stereotype that professional women in the workplace have to hate each other. That's funny and sometimes having ditzy Kat Grant around really works for a joke setup or for the kind of story that Mm. you're willing to tell but I think it's way cooler when they're both just excellent at their jobs. Uh, In in my head, Kat Grant and Lois Lane are friends. Yeah, in your your Daily Planet book that you're writing for DC Comics. Yes, (laughs) yes. But it took them years to get there. Yes, and and uh, and it would, especially if Cat mm. is introduced as kind of like a silly. I I because to me, yeah. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, I, please. I, I Calista Flockhart has dropped the name Lois Lane a couple of times mm-hmm. on the Supergirl TV show, and in my head, that. That Cat Grant because I think Cat Grant is older. Mm-hmm. She, I older think, than Lois? Yes, and Clark. Oh, yes. interesting. I, I, th- I in my in my head, Cat uh, Grant is in early forties, late thirties, mm-hmm. and Superman is in his early thirties, mm-hmm. and so is Lois Lane. Um, I've always seen Cat Grant as older. She's been around the block. Interesting. Um, she's more experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that that Cat Grant in the Supergirl TV show. I think she is friends with Lois. I think they're friends, but still professional rivals. So when one of them gets like a really good scoop, they're like, oh, damn, I wish I'd gotten that. Damn you. Yeah. And I think that they also, I think that Lois Lane for me and Cat Grant, especially that Cat Grant, when they have dinners, because I think they do, like when, mm-hmm. when she goes to Metropolis and when Lois comes to National City, they have dinners. And I think the first five minutes is them criticizing each other's articles. Totally. Until they reach the point where one of them outs insults the other one they laugh and then they have the normal dinner I'm just saying uh, for all the WB writers for Mr. Jeff John so I know is listening to this podcast um, I would kill to see that <laughs> on screen anywhere it would be totally amazing uh, so Kat even goes on to hire Mr. Jimmy Olsen. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if you were going to get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her number Miss, one fan. Mr. Action, as he's called when he gets hired. Oh, God. Yeah, horribly. Um, to work for her, uh, where they eventually get to work close together and form a close bond that they had never shared working yep. together at the Daily Planet. Now, by this point, Jimmy's a little bit older. He doesn't just seem yeah. like... Like, when you first meet Jimmy, he seems like he's like 18. Here, he's like, I don't know, maybe 25? They, during this story... They age him up quite a bit. He gets aged up too much. You think so? Yes, I think it's too much because it does make Jimmy seem really old. Uh, let me ask you this then, uh, just for my own... I'm just curious. Do you think that Jimmy is the same age as Dick Grayson? No, he's slightly younger. Okay, because I always saw them as the same age. So, oh, really? Yeah, I did. Because so, they're both the sidekicks? Yeah, and, and they were they both kind of served the same function in the Golden Age initially. So it doesn't bother me that they make him like in his mid to late 20s. I don't know, because to me, I kind of see Jimmy Olsen as the perpetual 21-year-old. Sure. And I see Dick Grayson as 25. Okay. So that's... So he's like Jason Todd age. 
Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Jimmy's definitely old enough to drink because to me, Jimmy has to be the person that can have a beer with Clark. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I'm just curious. Yeah. So the new boss of WGBS is Morgan Edge's father, Vinny Edge, because, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> and when Kat is promoted to station manager beneath him, rumors begin to swirl that it is because of her close, quote, personal, end quote, relationship with Vinny Edge. These rumors come to a stop when Kat files a sexual harassment suit against him. I remember that. Yeah. And he is promptly removed from the board of directors at WGBS, and Kat is given his seat there in recompense, and because she deserves it. I'm going to be honest with you. I kind of think that that... Com- I remember that comic book now. Yeah. I kind of think that that comic book is the reason why uh, 12-year-old me even knew what sexual harassment was. Um, I think it's super interesting when you think about the time in which this comic was written. This would have been 94, 95-ish. Which yeah. was when I feel like awareness about sexual harassment in the workplace really hit mm. a fever pitch and that's when it started being introduced in like workplace manuals and stuff like that so I think it's cool that again comics which is a really um, pulpy popular medium was like hey this is a serious issue and this is how we're going to address it and we're not going to make her the victim she's going to wind up on top mm-hmm. uh, which it kind of happens to Cat a lot speaking of victims uh, a villain called the Toy Man, who's really, really silly and just go with it, uh, Winslow Shot Sr., goes on a kidnapping spree across Metropolis soon after this, and Kat's son Adam is one of his victims. Yep, this is what I was talking about in my meet cute. Yes. Now, have you read this issue? I have. I actually think that this issue is great. I, I do. I think it's very sad. The death is is a little, I don't know about the death, but the issue is great because the whole issue is that Lois brings up the point to Clark that he's been like working nonstop since he's mm-hmm. since his resurrection. And she's like, you can take a night off. And I think they fly to Paris. I Yes. I think, and this is what happens. I think they fly to Paris. And so the night that they decide to spend a romantic night in Paris is the night that the toy man murders Adam. Yes. And so Clark comes back the next day and sees like just Cat like crying and stuff like that. Cat, a good friend of his, a good yes. colleague of his. And of his. course he blames himself because it's like the one night I took off, one of my close friend's son Suffered was murdered. Suffered a murder. personal tragedy, yeah. Now the murder might have been a little bit too far, but... This is a damn good issue. It is. And I will say, um, to to the story's credit, Adam does prove to be pretty brave and resourceful, living up to his he mother's saves reputation. Kids. He does. He even manages to escape for a little bit. And he's dressed as 90s Superboy. He sure is. With a leather jacket and everything. Um, unfortunately, like we've said, it doesn't work out so well for Adam, and he dies while escaping the toy man's clutches. So... Like the alcoholism that we talked about earlier, putting that aside, the death of Adam, it's probably Kat's most defining character moment. Yeah. This is the thing that changes her the most. And this is the thing that a lot of people remember her for when you bring up Kat Grant. Like if they if they don't know her from Supergirl, they know that her son died. Yeah. 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 And Kat, it was a big deal in the 90s. It was huge. Well, because killing a killing a comics character, I know it's become a cliche now, but it's still a big deal. It's not even that. And it killing was a child. Killing a child is what it was. Um, is, you know, an innocent is an even huger deal because it's one thing to kill Superman. It's another thing to kill like this innocent. And he, he is, it does state during this arc that he is 10 years old when he dies. Yeah. It's also another thing too, because most of Superman's villains are kind of, goofier kind of older dudes Mm -hmm. because they were created during the Silver Age and this story turned one of them into a murderer. Yes. Which is more Batman's territory than Superman. Definitely. And this is not the only time that Cat and the Toy Man are going to cross each other's paths. (gasps) Dun, dun, foreshadowing. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, so Kat deals with this tremendous loss by focusing her attention back into her work. Uh, again, a trait that you will recognize from the TV show. And not long after this, the Justice League publicly unveils a new team roster. And since they are concerned with their public face at that exact moment, they invite a handful of reporters to the watchtowers. <gasps> because that seems like a good idea. I know what this is. Yes. And Kat Grant is, of course, one of the reporters invited at Superman's behest. However... Cat Grant does not show up because she is attacked off panel by who, Jason? Uh, Prometheus. Uh, no, Catwoman. Yes, by Catwoman. Mm-hmm. Um, and Catwoman yeah, you... steals her clothes and credentials intent on breaking into and stealing from the Watchtower. Yep, this is during the Prometheus storyline in Grant Morrison's JLA run. Yes, and Prometheus uh, catches 
Catwoman and mm-hmm. un- and unveils her. So that's what you were probably yeah, thinking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, uh-huh. um, but here's my question to Catwoman at this time. What do you steal from the Watchtower? Uh, like, it's all just future tech. From what I... <laughs> Yeah, I also got the impression from that issue because I love that issue and mm-hmm. I've read it several times. Um, I always got the impression too that Batman paid her to be there. Yeah, I get the impression that Batman paid her to sneak onto the Watchtower just in case. Yeah, like it, it's sort of it's ambiguous whether or not it's a test. Yeah. but at the face of it, she's like, "Oh, mm-hmm. I came to steal things." And again, like, what do you steal? Yeah, like Wonder mm-hmm. Woman's lasso, maybe I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's cool stuff there, but it's not like you can hawk it. You can't sell it to a middleman when you get back. Yeah, to Earth. You, you can't really sell, like sell the 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 glove of like Brainiac Seven. You know, you can't really. <laughs> yeah. nobody's gonna buy that in a pawn shop. I also want to imagine like what is it like when you get the phone call or the email that's like hey would you like to come to the watch tower and you're like yeah and they're like great go here and get, on, get in a boom tube and we'll just shoot you in well, space. Well no it wasn't a boom tube at the time they were teleporting. So they, Even worse. They literally <laughs> had because the, at that time the watch tower was on the moon. That's right it wasn't, so it was, it it, wasn't, it wasn't yeah. a satellite. So they had literally Star Trek transporters that took people back and forth. Did they have little sound effects that were like, what? Well, yeah, and they, they, they were like, it was bluish white. Mm-hmm. And also mm-hmm. there was like, there was only like seven locations around the world. That's right. And you could they only, were like Stargates. Yes, and you could only access these these, these teleports if you had like the JLA communicator. That's so they opened right. it up. And Batman apparently had a transporter in his Batcave. Yeah, well, because why not? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the next story arc that Cat Grant appears in is is the era of President Lex Luthor. President Lex. Uh, which is one of Jason's uh, preferred storylines. Mm, year 2000. Yes. And Jason, do you know what her job is under President Lex Luthor? She is on his staff. Uh, is she White House press secretary? She is. She yep. is the CJ Craig. I couldn't remember whether she was... Like the press secretary, or whether she was like a in, liaison, or, or no, I couldn't remember whether she was actually in his cabinet because Lex Luthor ah. appointed a lot of interesting people to his cabinet. Well, and again, if you're going to do uh, President Lex Luthor, you have to fill his cabinet mm-hmm. with recognizable faces. Do you know who's? Can let's see. Like, let's go even deeper with Superman trivia. Can you tell me who Lex Luthor's vice president was? I cannot. Uh, <laughs> it was Pete Ross. Really? Yeah, from Smallville. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. And he La- went right from the IHOP and, to the White House. And Lana Lang, uh, of course, so that made that Lana Lang was part of the White House. Yes, that is yeah. true. Um, so White House press secretary is probably the highest position of power that Kat ever achieves in her career. She'd be great at it. Uh, she totally would. Yeah. And, and I just want to say that going from a gossip columnist, whether you're syndicated and respected or not, to the White House press secretary is a pretty impressive climb up the career ladder. Totally. Uh, it is nothing, definitely nothing to sneeze at. Uh, toward the end of this arc, Lex Luthor is, of course, impeached and removed from office. And so Kat kind of has nothing else to do. So she returns to her hometown of Los Angeles, California, where she is hired by the Los Angeles Tatler newspaper. I think that's a great name for a Los Angeles based newspaper. The Tatler is is uh, is used in several DC comic books. It's it's mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. kind of like Big Belly Burger. It's like a, it's like it's like a running gag of DC. Yeah, totally. And as new information arises in Metropolis concerning the Toy Man's involvement in Adam's death, Kat decides to move back from or back to the city, excuse me. So we have her... So she's back to Metropolis now. She does. Okay. So we have her doing the same move that she does when we first meet her. For her son, for the sake of living up to her son's legacy, she moves from Los Angeles to Metropolis, wherever Metropolis happens to be in the U.S., according to your head canon. East Coast. Uh, yes. <laughs> And the toy man tells Jimmy Olsen that he didn't kill Adam, but it was a robot created in case he was ever incarcerated in order to keep up appearances who killed Adam. And then, the, uh, okay. and then the toy man goes on to claim that he would never harm children, that it was merely a glitch in the robot's programming that it turned it into a murderer. And this will eventually be confirmed in Superman's Secret Files and Origins, uh, which comes out in 2009. But more about that later. So uh, that's a really silly story that does get corroborated. Kids, let me tell you this. Uh, <laughs> PSA from Professor Jason. Superman of the mid-2000s wasn't so great. It really wasn't. Is that the whole PSA? Yeah, pretty much. It wasn't great. Okay, I'm sorry. It, re- it really wasn't. It was really good at like 99 to like 2002, and then it just got really bad. 
Aw, that's too bad. I, you know, well, we're we're right smack dab in the middle of that. We went, so. to, we went to the high of President Lex, and then they just never recovered from it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I would I would even say the death of Superman was a pretty high point. Yeah, but as, as far as notoriety well, and, and, true, and storytelling, true. And there are some really dumb '90s Superman stories. I will fair point, but. The 90s run of Superman when he has the mullet, when he gets married to Lois, I love when, that. when he turns electric, uh, when he uh, put, gets put on trial by the universe, mm-hmm. when he, uh, like, it, yes, it is silly. Yes, it hasn't aged well, but there are a lot of, like, it's a great, ep- the 90s Superman has some great tales in there. Okay. Uh, 2000 start out really good. And then it's for some reason just seems like in the mid two thousands that like kind of everybody forgot how to write Superman. Oh, that's so sad. I'm sorry, but I've read it. It's not great. Well, we don't know what notes were coming down from editorial, but if yeah. Jason says that, it's probably true. Yeah. So the Daily Planet offers Cat another job as the editor of the arts and entertainment section, which is definitely not White House press secretary, but it is a big step up from her first gig with them. She accepts, of course, and Clark, Lois, and Perry notice a personality shift in Cat when she returns to work. Not only does she dress more provocatively, but she's more flirtatious than she has ever been in the past. And I personally think that this version of Cat Grant is the one that modern comic book readers are most familiar with. And they associate the ditzy, silly Cat Grant that you see in Smallville with this comics incarnation. You want to well. know why? Please. Because that version of Cat Grant was introduced by Jeff Johns. Well, there you because, go. You're, you're, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Because about, I think it was 2008 ish is when he began his run on action comics with Richard Donner. And, yes. and that's where he reintroduced Cat Grant and Steve Labarde. Oh, I love Steve yep. Lombard. He's a total skis, but mm-hmm. I really like him in The Daily Planet. And a moment that really epitomizes this personality shift is when Kat is flirting with Clark Kent and openly tells him that she has had breast implants. Yep. Uh, this moment is recalled in a panel where Supergirl can yep. see Kat's fake boobs and comments on it. I guarantee you will see this panel I've shared, shared on, it on Facebook. I've shared it on my Twitter. Every six months. Yeah, I, yeah. I see it like twice a year. Well, it, it's not that. Uh, it's it's because Supergirl, because she grew up in Krypton, she doesn't get. She doesn't have tact. Well, she also. No, no. She doesn't understand them. Oh so, yes. So she's actually she's like she's she's I think the line that or something close to this is she says they're like why are there liquid sacks grafted inside your body? Yeah yeah yeah. And, and <laughs> you, you kind of see like Superman's hand going yeah, 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 going yeah. to grab her mm-hmm. off. It is very innocent um, on, on Supergirl's behalf, but it's also not very polite by uh, by our human standards, it's, shall we? It's not the greatest shall joke, shall but yeah, say. there you go. Uh, Lois Lane thinks that Kat's change behavior is because she is now a cougar, uh, but Clark sees right through the act, and he tells Lois off, explaining that it is a reaction to the loss of her son. Now, if you want to keep Jason and I from getting fake breast implants because we suffer a tragic loss... But maybe I want to. Well, then that's just great. You can still head over and support that at patreon.com slash jawin, (laughs) (laughs) J-A-W-I-I-N. Thank you, touche, touche. Where you can get all kinds of great, great things in order... Or for a little bit of your support, you can get the Geek History Lesson Extra podcast where we are going to talk about what we think Supergirl Season 2 is going to hold. Yeah. And you can even get Geek History Lesson a day early and drop all of the sick Cat Grant knowledge on your friends. Thank you so much to everyone who has supported us over there. You mean the world to us and we love you. Now let's get back to some Cat Grant gossip. So when a uh, writer and friend of the podcast, Sterling Gates, took over writing the Supergirl title, readers saw Kara and Kat having more interactions, although not always in the most polite and best friendy kind of way. He did an interview with Newsarama explaining this where he said, we're integrating Supergirl's book more into the Superman universe, and that includes having a supporting cast that overlaps with that world. I'm very interested in tying her back into Metropolis and making sure that her world is a part of the Superman Man universe. So for my first issue in the first three pages, I set up a foil for her in Cat Grant. And Cat Grant will be a regular supporting cast member, as will Lana Lang. And this is one of my favorite things about um, this series is that Supergirl does get a lot of really good female mentors and sometimes rivals yeah. in the humans that surround her. And I think putting her in Metropolis and including her in the Superman world um, is a really great choice. You know, uh, what also is great is it just goes to show you, and it's something that a lot of people I don't think realize about Superman, is that Superman 
has is surrounded by a lot of very strong females. Yes. I mean, Lois Lane, Cat Grant, Lana Lang. You name like three. We've talked about three of them. Mm-hmm. Like they're all strong. They all really matter. And, and I he think respects impo- them all. And he respects every single one of them. And 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 they're power players. They're yeah. power movers and shakers. You know. I would even include. Uh, I would even include Martha Kent in that because she's his moral center. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Throw her in there. So very well said. Mm-hmm. Very well said. Uh, throughout this series, Cat Grant holds a grudge against Supergirl for a couple of different reasons. First is the lack of respect that Supergirl has for you. Remember when we talked about the fake boob comments? The, the just boobs. Now? Um, and second is Supergirl's careless handling of a fight that leaves Cat wounded and. Uh, bruised ego on the inside as well and considering these two things it's pretty easy to empathize with Kat's feelings like I don't know if I would be Supergirl's biggest fan either when Mm -hmm. you don't know all sides of the story Kat does even go so far as to start a smear campaign against Supergirl using the Daily Planet as her platform now I have read this uh, this series but when I when I see this written down on paper, it just makes me think of Cat Grant being like, bring me pictures of Supergirl. She's a menace. <laughs> and in retaliation to Supergirl in her secret identity as Lana Lang's younger cousin, Linda Lang, she visits Cat in her workplace to torment her. So uh, Linda, okay. Linda Lang is always like showing up at the Daily Planet and she's like, hi, Cat, how's it going? And Cat's like, go away. I'm working on Supergirl stuff. <laughs> so she's just kind of like a gnat around Cat's yeah, yeah. head in the I office. That. That's cool. And soon Kat learns that Linda's super, uh, who Linda's super alter ego is, and that Lana is her aunt. Dun, dun, dun. Because she's a good reporter, and it takes her less than 50 years like Lois Lane. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> when she tries to tell Perry about her discovery, he's too busy and refuses to listen to her. <laughs> he's like, nobody cares. He's like, it's not 1938. You can't buy Great an apple. Great Caesar's <laughs> ghost. I don't care. Exactly. Without Perry's help, Kat moves on to the next best thing and confronts Lana with her knowledge. Her relationship with Supergirl does improve uh, not long after this when they travel to Arkham Asylum together in order to interrogate the Toy Man. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. Remember I said we weren't done with him? Oh, Lord. Um, I actually think it's really nice that Supergirl does go with Kat as kind of her escort and her bodyguard for this because... Kat is pretty capable, but she's definitely no superhero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she asked the toy man about the children he murdered along with Adam and the dolls that he had left behind in their stead. Because uh, that's kind of a creepy thing that the toy man does. Mm-hmm. And he makes the same claim of his innocence to Kat that he'd made to Jimmy Olsen in an earlier storyline. And this is the story that it gets confirmed and that it wasn't him. It was this weird robot and da 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 I don't like that. You don't have to like it. It's canon. All right. (laughs) Welcome to comics. (laughs) Later on, when Toy Man is attacked by a robotic doll, Supergirl saves his life and Kat gets mad at her for doing this. She's kind of of the mind of like, you should have let him die. And Supergirl was like, but I'm a superhero and I can't do that. (laughs) It's like that Batman thing. When Kat returns to her home, she is confronted by a villain called the Dollmaker, mm-hmm. who fans of the Arrow television show should recognize, who binds and gags her like any good comic villain would do. Dollmaker's deal is that he kidnaps children and experiments on them in order to turn them into his slaves or his dolls. He reveals to Kat that he is an abandoned son of the toy maker and presents himself as a stand in for Kat's dead son. He wants You mean Kat- the toy man, not the toy maker? I'm sorry, that's right. Yeah, okay. Um, and he wants Kat to be his new mother. So, essentially, he is a character who Winslow Shot Jr. in the Supergirl series could turn into at the drop of a hat any moment now. And he's like, well, my dad didn't like me, and you don't have a son, so why don't you be my mom? And as one would suspect, Kat viciously rejects him because what the heck kind of proposition is that, you crazy person? I, I'll tell you what, you, you brought up uh, uh, Winslow Shot. Shot? Shot. Shot, excuse me. S-C-H-O-T-T. Uh, yes. Um, becoming the doll maker. Mm-hmm. I do think, oh, we'll talk about that. Well, I, maybe I'll save it. But I was like, I, 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 I do think the Supergirl TV show will eventually... Do the do do the episode where Toy Man kills Adam. Uh, I I agree with you, but let's say that for the extra. Sure. So now the doll maker had to take Kat's gag off in order to hear her response to his proposition, and she uses this opportunity to call out for Supergirl to save her. And while I'm not a huge fan of the damsel in distress storyline, I like that. Kat could have called for help 
from Superman. She could have called for help from Batman, like from anybody else. She could have said she crypto. Cho- exactly. <laughs> uh, but she, Here, boy. She, she chooses Supergirl and she trusts her enough to know that even though they don't always get along, she'll show up and she'll have her back. Din din, crypto. Din din. Oh my God. <laughs> crypto shows up. Oh my God. <laughs> and he's just running in circles and he's totally useless. <laughs> that would be the best. That's great. Uh, copyright geek history lesson. You can hire us to write your cartoons. <laughs> Together, they are able to subdue the doll maker and free the children that he had hidden away in the same building. Yep. And I think this is a really nice heroic moment that Kat doesn't get very often, if ever, in her capacity as a non-superpowered being. Cool. This arc ends with another really nice moment where Kat finally writes a piece heralding Supergirl's powers as a holiday gift and a thank you to the Girl of Steel. Aww. So it's like literally her Christmas present is she Aww. writes a really nice article about uh, about how Kat, about how uh, Supergirl saved her and is a worthy successor to her cousin, which Aww. is kind of always the struggle of a Supergirl series, like can I live up to this legacy that is uh, set before me. Aww. And in the 2009 series, Superman Secret Origins, yep. Kat gets her only real retcon in the uh, in in her entire history in the post Infinite Crisis universe. It wasn't well. Super Superman Secret Origin is full of retcons. So. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, but Jason, real quick, what is Infinite Crisis? Infinite Crisis is the storyline written by Jeff Johns. Uh, in 2006, I believe, where Superboy Prime and the original Golden Age Superman and Alexander Luther, you find out they survived the Crisis on Infinite Earth, the first DC reboot, and now they're back into the DC universe and they're trying to bring back the old DC multiverse. Yes, and the only real change to the story is that Cat is uh, already established as a member of the Daily Planet staff when Clark Kent joins the paper. Originally, Clark was obviously a staffer and then Cat joins, so we get a little switcheroo mm. right there. But Secret Origin, by the way, is uh, five years after Infinite Crisis. Yes. They're, they are not related. No, but it's it's her only retcon it after, inf- uh, it's, the only retcon she gets is after Infinite Crisis okay. as a part of the wave of characters kind of getting retcons. Right. But it's, again, because, she, remember at the top where I said she was a yeah. supporting mm-hmm, character? Mm-hmm. It took five years to retcon yeah, the, her. Yeah, yeah, the Infinite Crisis, the Secret Origin is sort of hinted that, uh, Secret Origin is sort of hinted that it that it is the new yeah post Infinite Crisis Origin. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that brings us up to date. Wow. On Cat Grant. No, nothing of the New Fifty Two. Literally nothing of consequence in the New Fifty Two. Well, can we talk about the New Fifty Two a little bit because Cat is in the New Fifty Two. Sure, go ahead. Um, now, if you remember when Scott Liddell in the new Superman storyline, Superman's more uh, action based and also like that. Superman quits the Daily Planet in the New Fifty Two for does. a series of issues, and he tries to get a bunch of people because I think it's Morgan Edge. I can't remember right who's trying to make him write a storyline. It is, yeah. That he does doesn't want to write and he tries sort of does like a Jerry Maguire moment where he's like we're not going to do this and we're not going to kowtow and who's coming with me <laughs> and the only person that comes with them is Cat. Yes. And they form their own blog. Now, I think that that storyline is a brilliant idea. I thought it was a great idea and I kind of like that Cat came with them because initially they're successful. The stupid thing about that storyline is the name for their company. What is it? It's Clark Cat Tropolis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dot com. <laughs> but because of Clark, he kind of does the Superman exclusives and the site does really well. But then eventually, Perry White, when Jeff Johns takes over Superman again with John Romita Jr., uh, Clark Kent comes back to the Daily Planet. But that, to me, is the significant thing of the New 52 is that Clark Cat Tropolis whole line. It's like I said, I think it's a fascinating storyline. Stupid name, but a fascinating storyline. There you go. Um, and she is about to appear in Supergirl Rebirth. Yep. And we know nothing about it. Yeah. Um, we're very, very excited. So really quick, uh, let's talk about some alternate universe versions of Cat Grant, shall oh, we? Okay. So in the antimatter universe... Dog a- Grant. A- I wish. <laughs> A.K.A. Puppy Grant. The yep. home of the crime syndicate, Cat Grant works at the Daily Planet. Mm-hmm. She is an extremely thin, full of plastic surgery, more mean-spirited version of herself. And this is established in JLA Earth 2 by Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely, if you cool. want to go. She's, she's a very uh, supporting player. Yeah, graphic this. novel, yep. Um, but yeah, she's basically meaner version. And then Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly's all-star Superman, Cat is her classic incarnation, a gossip colonist at the Daily Planet. And from these two things, it is clear to me that Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly really like introducing Cat Grant into their versions of Metropolis. Yep. And remember the cartoon show The Batman? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I have the Batgirl action figure. Mm-hmm. It had a spinoff comic or a tie-in comic called The Batman Strikes! Yeah, exclamation point. I remember that comic. 
And in issue number 44, Cat Grant makes a cameo appearance when Batman visits the Daily Planet, uh, which, of course, he owns. Yep, he does. And uh, that is it for your geek history lesson on Miss Cat Grant. Wow. Are we not going to talk about the Supergirl TV show? Or are we just going to leave that be? Uh, we're just going to leave that be okay. because we think we would run a little bit long. Sure. No problem. Yeah. So uh, why don't we move right into recommended reading? Yes, yeah, so recommended reading where we're going to recommend some books that you should read. And guess what? If you go to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading, we are going to give you the links to all of this stuff that we're going to recommend. You click on that link, it takes you right to Amazon. You can buy that book right away with the power of the internet. And a little bit of that purchase comes back and helps support the Mind University. And we thank you guys for, uh, we've seen some people uh, buy some books. Uh, some Miles Morales has, have been selling and a couple Superman books. So uh, thank you guys for going to Geek History Lesson Recommended Reading. Yeah, it's really cool of you. Now, I have three recommendations for you, but you have to understand that Cat Grant is very much a supporting character. Yep. If you pick up any Superman story where he is working at the Daily Planet, you're going to get some Cat Grant. But these three are, in my opinion, your best choices to get the full Cat Grant experience. And they're all by Sterling Gates, so just Google his name and I'm sure they'll come <laughs> up. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so there are only, um, there are only, I was, I was going to recommend All Star Superman. Yeah, but she's but barely we, in it. She's barely in it, and yeah. we have recommended that in many, many different episodes before, so uh-huh. I'm leaving that off. Um, the only two trades from his original Supergirl run that you can get are Who is Superwoman and Bizarro Girl, and this is the Supergirl Cat Grant rivalry that leads up and inspires, I would say, the Supergirl series. It is some of the most Cat Grant that you will get on the page, and they have a really fun and interesting dynamic there. And you can also pick up Adventures of Supergirl Volume 1, which is the tie-in comic to the CBS Now CW TV show. So if you like the TV show, you're going to love that book. Yes, uh, where it is all the incredible nations that you recognize from your television screen. Cool. So those are the three trades that I would recommend that you pick up. Yay. And now we're going to move into the discussion section of our podcast where Professor Ashley is going to give us some topics and we might discuss them. We we might will discuss them. Okay. So remember when we talked about how Cat Grant had a talk show, The Cat Grant Show? Yes. So she gets Superman on there, which is pretty cool. And one can only assume that in the DC... Uh, you know, Earth One universe, a superhero is your biggest get. They're bigger get than a TV star, a movie star, a writer, 100%, whoever. Yeah. I want to know, Jason, which superheroes do you think would actually come on the Cat Grant show and would give up an hour of their time for some airtime? Do you have any choices? Um, I think the most obvious answer is Booster Gold. 100%. Booster Gold's going to be there all day, yeah. every day, kicking it with Cat Grant. Like, he'll, he would be like... um. You know how every talk show has that one celebrity who's a friend of the host and they just mm-hmm. keep popping back in whenever a guest pops out? That's who Booster Gold is. If would you be. don't think that Booster Gold wouldn't pitch the cooking segment within three minutes of being on that show, you're crazy. Oh my God. And Skeets would run the band. He would Booster's be the band conductor. Breakfast with Booster. I would watch that. 10 out of 10 would definitely watch. Uh, I think The Flash would go on there. Which Flash? Uh, Barry and Wally would go. I think so. Wally's identity was public for the majority of his career until that was retconned. That's true. Uh, Um, I think Oliver Queen would. I think uh, Green Arrow definitely would. I mean, his identity has been public in the past. But now it's secret again. Yeah, but I think if you got like mayor of the city... Oliver Queen would go on, or Public Identity Green Arrow would go on? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe. It depends on, like, what social... Fa- if, he, if, he, if he thinks he could take down a corporation, yeah. he, he would go on there. Um, I think Lex Luthor is on there. Yep. Um, All the time. Yep. I think the Bat family, I think Dick Grayson goes on there because it go- the show's been on for years, and he's like... Nightwing is like, hey, like we we need to clean up our public image. Just I don't let think me. a single member of the Batman. You don't think so? No, Batman won't let him. I think Dick Grayson would be the only one no. who could maybe because he doesn't always listen to Batman. No, Batman would forbid him. Who do you think? Do you have any more suggestions? Uh, yeah, nobody. No, no, no. Batman guards their identity so much that he wouldn't let anybody have any kind of videotape <laughs> of him. Um, you know, Wonder Woman would go on there as an ambassador at Themyscira. Totally, like Greg Rucka era Wonder Woman. Yeah, Wonder Woman would go on there. Um, Interesting, interesting. I think Cyborg would go on. Yeah, Cyborg would be on there. Um, Because his identity is pretty public. There, I'm trying to think of like we uh, other... It, it's interesting. It's talking about superheroes because there are certain ones like... Even though Green Lantern is a glory hog, I don't think he would go on there. Um, I don't think Aquaman would ever go on there. Mm-mm. I, Wonder Woman would go on there. Superman you'd be hard to get because Superman would be like, I'm, I'm too busy. 
I think she could probably get Supergirl. I think she could um, get Supergirl. If she could clear her schedule. I think you could maybe get Martian Manhunter because his identity is fairly public. Well, he doesn't have a secret identity, so there you go. Right. So, why not? Yeah, I think Martian Manhunter would do it. Be like, who is Martian Manhunter? Mm, I'm trying to think of some other people's. Ted Cord Blue Beetle would go on there. Yeah, yeah. Not Jaime, though. Uh, no, 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 no. Jaime would be too nervous. He would never go on there. I'm trying to think of some other. I think that's about it. Yeah. I, so. I think of the main people. That, I mean, Flash would be the first person, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, that's my question for discussion because we're going to talk about our uh, Supergirl season two predictions on Geek History Lesson Extra awesome. today. Awesome. So let's move to the next section of the podcast, which is the teaching tweet where Professor Ashley and 140 characters or less will tell you what she thinks about Cat Grant and 140 characters or less. Like she, she was tweeting it, which is what we know it matters. Cat Grant. Mother, journalist, Supergirl. How awesome is that? Oh, you're calling her a Supergirl? Well, I am calling her a Supergirl. Okay. Uh, what's wrong with girl? I didn't say there was anything wrong with girl. I am calling her a Supergirl. I call lots of women girl. <laughs> so that's my that's my cat grant tweet. Cool. All right. Uh, I want to know anything, any final thoughts that you had that you learned from Cat Grant from this lesson because I would say your biggest exposure to Cat Grant is probably the Supergirl TV show. What did you definitely? What did you? What do you? Do you have any new appreciation for comic book Cat Grant? I do because I didn't know a lot about comic book Cat Grant, and comic book Cat Grant has really been through it. Yeah. Um, and when I was doing my research, I tweeted this: I would love to write a Cat Grant standalone, like four issue miniseries. I think mm. there's a lot of really interesting character stuff. Um, that can be mined with her more tragic backstories and with her drive. I think, too, um, you in the past have talked about, like, why doesn't the Daily Planet have a series? And yep. I think uh, she would be a great co-lead for something like that. I think. Kat, oh, she's in that book. Um, I think she is a character who's prime for more exposure than she gets. I think she's interesting enough mm. to deserve more time on panel. Nice. Yep. Cool. Well, that's going to do it for our Geek History Lesson on Cat Grant. Guys, you can go to iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud and subscribe to this podcast and you're going to get a new lesson most weeks. And uh, don't forget that uh, uh, we like your reviews over there. So you should leave us a review over there on the podcast, on the iTunes page, because it lets people find the podcast just like you. And Ashley, if they want to suggest more cool lessons... Like Cat Grant in the future, where can they do that? They can do that on Facebook.com slash Geek History Lesson or GeekHistoryLesson.com. There's a bunch of different ways to contact us in both of those places. Yes, and then where can they find us on the Twitter? Uh, you can tweet me cool pictures of Cat Grant at Ashley V. Robinson, and you can hit up Jason at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N. That's right. And Ashley... Um, what do you think? Would Cat Grant listen to our podcast? What do you think? I think she would. I think Cat Grant is very technologically forward, and I think she likes to be in the zeitgeist. <laughs> she is. She is. She. She is usually the one who will like tap into like oh iPhones, oh the internet, uh, quicker than Lois because she's like a hip cat, you know. Um, and I think that she likes to be in the zeitgeist, and I think that we represent a big part of the zeitgeist. Nice. Uh, real quick, uh, faithful listeners, I just want to let you know that next week there will not be a Geek History lesson. We got some stuff going on. We have some things we can't tell you about that are going to be happening. So uh, we won't have the time to record a lesson next week, and that means the same for Geek History Lesson Extra. So just go back and listen to one of our, our previous episodes. We have Superman, the Golden Age. I think a great companion to Cat Grant episode is the Lois Lane episode. Exactly. Our Taught by Jason and Yeah, our episode number 50, one of my favorite episodes. So we will not have an episode next week, but we'll see you the very, very next week after that with an in-depth discussion on Flashpoint Ooh. with special guest Sam Basher. What? From SourceFed. What? That's right. All right, guys, let's close out this podcast. I'm Jason Kitty Cat Inman. Here, boy, here, boy. <laughs> I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And Professor Ashley, would you please close out this CatCo-sponsored podcast? Class is now dismissed.